Hi, this is Dr. Balkan Devlin. I'm the director for Center in Modern Czechish Studies at Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carlton University. And today I'm joined by Professor Sahad Guvanch to talk in this MTS, the Center in Modern Turkish Studies and Council of, on Turkish, uh, of, of Turkish uh, Canadians, a joint panel on the evolution and the history of um, Turkish Navy. Um, it's, this panel is being live streamed uh, on YouTube and uh, it's also being recorded. We will um, have about an hour uh, to talk. We, uh, Sarah, Professor Gavench will have about half an hour um, uh, to talk about uh, the hundred years uh, or so of, of of Turkish naval history, and then we will open up uh, for questions and answers. If you have questions, please uh, do type them in the chat, and at the end, I will collect them and ask uh, Professor Guvenc. Uh Professor Sayat Guvenc uh, is currently a professor of international relations at Kadir Has University. Uh, previously, he, ha he held faculty positions uh, at Istanbul Big University and lectured as a vis visiting assistant professor at the University of Chicago uh, in the Department of History. Uh, as adjunct professor of international relations at Koch University and Boazic University. In 2004, he became the first Turkish scholar awarded a fellowship for the uh, West, West Point Summer Seminar in Military History. Uh, Dr. Gubanj's uh, research interests include maritime security and modern Turkish military and naval history. He has co he authored uh, three books, Osmanlı'nın um, Dreadnought Dışları, The Ottomans' uh, Quest for Dreadnoughts um, in 2009, a, a Turkey in, in the Mediterranean uh, during the interwar era in 2010, and uh, NATO, uh, six years in, in NATO, Turkey's contribution to the transatlantic security in 2013. He also published uh, numerous articles in peer-reviewed um, journals. Uh, Professor Gavanch is a board member of the Foundation of Lausanne Treaty uh, Immigrants. Um, uh, Sarah Tojam, uh, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. And when, particularly on this day uh, of March 18th, where in Turkey we commemorate the, um, the fallen uh, of the naval war um, at Gallipoli in the First World War. Um, and I think this is a very topical uh, issue to talk about today. Uh, on, on Turkish Navy and, and Turkish naval history from the dreadnoughts to the blue homeland concept today. And it was a lot to cover uh, in half an hour to 35 minutes, um, but I'd, I'd like to open up and, and give the floor to you to give us a, a very broad overview of how um, Turkey's uh, naval strategy and, and understanding of, uh, of the place of Navy uh, evolved in the last hundred years. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Devlan. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks for picking such a topical issue or uh, title for the presentation today. Uh, but, you know, after giving some thought to the idea, I realized how difficult it would be to cover a time span of more than a, a century indeed. And I struggled to find the connection between the dreadnoughts and the blue homeland, you know, the current concept, the, cu the current naval strategy or doctrine, however you call it. And as you may notice, you may have noticed I'm wearing a hat uh, that is, you know, bearing the, uh, the concept blue homeland, Mavi Vatan in Turkish. And this is not a naval cap indeed. I mean, this is the cap of a private sailing club, but the idea has taken, you know, gained so much traction in, in Turkey, you know, has gained, has captured the popular imagination, you know, I mean, uh, talking about uh, Blue Homeland uh, is, uh, you know, uh, is, how should I say, is a rewarding, I would say, uh, especially in the context of uh, Turkey, is a re rewarding venture indeed. Uh, but I'm going to stop here. I'm just going to take my hat off uh, because I was trying to make a point. Uh, I have a, a short presentation. Uh, I have about 28 slides. So since I have uh, half an hour, I assume that I will be able to cover them in the time uh, allocated to me. Uh, my ideas trans transpired as I gave more and more thought on the link between the two, you know, uh, 
let's see. Okay, yes. Okay, here we go. Okay, so it's from Dreadnoughts to Blue Homeland, a conversation on Turkish naval strategy. Now that I have a presentation, of course, this no longer can be defined as a conversation, but rather a, uh, again, a, a paper presentation. But also you will find uh, the, the, the outline of my thinking about uh, to the evolution of Turkish naval power or Turkish understanding of sea power and maritime security. The link between the two, you know, dreadnoughts, they belong to uh, a, a different age, you know, uh, we're talking about, uh, and dreadnoughts were an, an extinct uh, class of battleships, but they were, you know, very popular. They were very important more than a century ago, but they became instinct. And current doctrine of Blue Homeland, Mavi Vatan, how, do, how these two, how do these two relate? What, what is the link between the two? Well, after, you know, uh, giving, again, uh, the thought, the idea, I realized that the link between the two is this gentleman in the center of this presentation, the late Admiral uh, Özden Örnek, uh, who was uh, the commander in chief of the Turkish Navy. Well, on the right hand side of, of the screen, you see the cover of my first book, Osmanlıların Dreadnought Düşleri, the Ottoman's quest for the dreadnoughts on the eve of the First World War. Well, he was the one who commissioned me to write this book. And on the right hand side, uh, you see a picture of Turkey's national pride, Milgam, national uh, warship or uh, other class corvettes, you know, indigenously designed and built. And uh, other class corvette was the, or is the brainchild of the late uh, Admiral Özden Örnek. This is the link. Of course, I'm kind of overemphasizing my role in this whole venture, but I'm just exaggerating. This is my presentation. So I think, you know, uh, I'm entitled to make a big fuss about uh, this link. But uh, the point he was trying to make when he uh, commissioned me to write this book was to revisit the story of the two Ottoman dreadnoughts, dreadnought battleships, they, and their seizure uh, by the British uh, Admiralty under Winston Churchill. His idea was to draw attention, the public and institutional attention to the consequences on dependence on foreign suppliers of military hardware, because those two battleships, Reşadi and Sultan Osman, were considered vital for the defense of the Ottoman Empire in the early uh, 20th century, but when uh, after this, uh, the Sarajevo crisis, you know, uh, uh, the first Lord of, Lord of Admiralty Churchill decided to commandeer them and he commissioned them uh, uh, with the Royal Navy. So this was, there was a lesson, huge lesson there. And uh, you know the rest of the story, then the Ottomans were denied means of defending themselves against the rising Russian threat in the north. And in, in their stead, in, instead of these two dreadnought battleships, you know, the Germans step it, stepped in and offered their two cruisers, uh, 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 SMS Gerben and SMS uh, Breslau. And there you have uh, the Ottoman decision for war. So uh, the, in this chain of events, of course, this British decision stood out as a milestone in defining, deciding the fate of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, around the around that time, I mean, he was uh, taking great strides in promoting uh, the idea of a nationally designed and built warship. A, a modest project it was. Uh, it, it would be in the size of uh, a corvette, and but it would be optimized for operations in the Aegean, because what they had in mind at the time in the Navy was that the principal area of operation or preoccupation for the Navy was the Aegean because of the problems with Greece. And at the time, uh, the units the Turkish Navy had, you know, were not suitable, were not optimized for operating in a semi-closed sea like the Aegean. They had fast attack craft uh, uh, boats, which were, you know, uh, too small um, with, little, uh, with shorter endurance. And, and uh, also they had frigates, they, which were too big and uh, 
were not optimized for operations in such a theater of war. Therefore, uh, the first Turkish nationally uh, designed and produced warship was optimized for uh, the Aegean. On the, at the bottom of this presentation, you see uh, an, an extract uh, uh, from a Turkish leading Turkish paper, a mainstream paper, Haber Türk, and a famous popular historian. You know, uh, when the United States suspended Turkey's participation in the Joint Strike Fighter program, you know, uh, the similarity, the analogy was almost inevitable, you know, and he brought up the case of the two uh, dreadnought battleships uh, the Brits had commandeered on the eve of the war, and now the Americans were doing the same thing to Turkey, you know, denying Turkey uh, the F-35s, which were fully paid by the uh, Turkish government of the time. So from dreadnoughts to blue, blue, ha blue homeland, what, what do uh, the, the dreadnoughts and the Milgam or the national uh, warship had in common was the principal focus on the Aegean. You know, uh, both the dreadnoughts and the current other class corvettes were meant for operations in the Aegean. This was their common mission. And to this end indeed for the Aegean, uh, the empire, the Ottoman empire ordered uh, two dreadnought battleships, but one could not be uh, built because of lack of funds. But later, the Ottoman Empire bought the world's, back then, the largest dreadnought battleship, which was ordered and building, uh, ordered by and building for Brazil. And uh, this huge and expensive dreadnought was up for sale uh, towards the end of the building. And uh, Ottoman Empire outbid other uh, interested parties and indeed uh, uh, bought this dreadnought battleship. Well, why? The moral of the story, I mean, to cut the long story short, uh, both dreadnoughts and Milgam indeed represented Ottoman and Republican versions of replies to the Greek naval power in the Aegean. In 1912, during the Balkan Wars, the islands in the Aegean fell into the hands of Greece one by one due to Greek naval superiority thanks to a single warship. That was cruiser Averov, Italian built uh, uh, cruiser, which was able to dominate the Aegean Sea uh, while the Ottomans were busy in the, in the battlefields in the, in the Balkans. Uh, uh, the Greek sailors and Greek soldiers uh, could uh, take over those islands without much resistance. So Cruiser Avoriov became the nemesis of the Ottoman Navy indeed. And it was a symbol of uh, Greek uh, accomplishments during the Balkan War. So the Ottomans, uh, especially the leaders of the Union and Progress Party, you know, uh, thought about acquiring dreadnoughts in order to overturn the balance of power in the Aegean in their favor and recapture those islands. Therefore, the dreadnoughts were supposed to help the Ottomans regain the lost uh, islands in Greece. Uh, this is a picture or card postcard, card post, uh, postal card from uh, the 20s, I guess, of Georgia. Yorgo Averov or George Averov, a famous or infamous uh, Greek cruiser, depending on your uh, perspective. But with the eruption of the First World War, the Ottomans focus shifted away from the Aegean to the Black Sea because it was Russia, which was the number one threat for the Ottoman Empire and naval balances in the Black Sea became more important than the islands in the Aegean on the eve of the First World War. Uh, the Black Sea in the north, in the, in, an, in the order of importance, Black Sea in the north uh, and the Aegean in the west. The Eastern Mediterranean indeed did not come into sharp focus for the Turkish naval strategists or naval planners until the mid 1960s. Therefore, initially the focus was on these two theaters, Black Sea in the North and the Aegean in the West. Now, as for Turkey's relationship or relation with, uh, uh, with the seas surrounding Turkey, uh, I just, I made this rough calculation uh, uh, and this calculation is based on a distance from 100 kilometers from the Turkish coastline. So according to my calculations, 
about 65% of Turkish population lives in coastal regions. And you see here the figures uh, for population for various regions. The Marmara, which is the uh, most popul populous region of Turkey, you know, is home to 24.5 million uh, Turks. The Black Sea 7.5, the Mediterranean 10.5, and the Aegean almost as uh, as many as the the Mediterranean with 10.3 million people. Uh, as regards to Turkey's interest in the surrounding seas, uh, I kind of jumped to the era of the Cold War because be between the two world wars and, 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 and the, in the early, during the second world war, there was not very much to talk about except the Italian tur threat Turkey uh, perceived uh, uh, for much of the interwar years. But the irony of the matter was that Turkey <coughs> relied on Italian built uh, destroyers, submarines and fast attack craft to indeed tackle the Italian threat uh, at that time because uh, during the interwar years, Italy was the only country which was willing and able to sell Turkey uh, naval vessels under very favorable law terms of uh, credit terms. Uh, the Second World War, there was not much activity. The Turkish Navy was kind of uh, bottled up in the Sea of Marmara. There was no uh, significant operations. And indeed, uh, the Navy never sailed into the Black Sea until 1952, when uh, Turkey became a member of NATO. At the time, Aegean was not a problem in the early Cold War years, nor was uh, uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. It was uh, the province of... Uh, uh, it was kind of uh, the, uh, the area of influence of Britain and Turkey was not so unhappy with the British control of the island of Cyprus. But in the post-Cold War era, you know, this situation changed dramatically. Once the Soviet fleet or the Soviet Navy dis disappeared, the Black Sea became a Turkish leg for a while, for a short while. But Turkey was... Uh, the top dog in the naval hierarchy in the Black Sea in the first decade after the end of the Cold War. The Aegean disputes, you know, continued to proliferate and continued to uh, adversely influence the relationship between Turkey and uh, Greece until 1999. So after 1999, we had the rapprochement. It seems that rapprochement still alive. Uh, although not as strong as uh, uh, 20, 10 or 20 years ago. In the Mediterranean, where Turkish naval activism, you know, uh, figured um, more as most assertively these days, uh, Turkey is acting, has been acting like a lone wolf. Now, I'll elaborate on what I had, uh, what I had just said. The Black Sea, in the Black Sea, the Soviet Navy had vanished and the emerging power vacuum filled by Turkey because at the time Turkish Navy was modernizing. It was a late, indeed, Turkey was kind of a latecomer to, the, to modernizing its Navy in step with other NATO members, but Turkish modernization effort indeed coincided with this emergence of uh, power vacuum by, left by the Soviet Union. Um, and indeed, taking advantage of its uh, superior status, uh, Turkey uh, kind of uh, advocated and, uh, and led a number of regional uh, security initiatives, which uh, collectively became uh, the parts of a regional security architecture involving not only the literals, but uh, non-literals like Greece uh, and Armenia and Azerbaijan as well. This uh, regional security uh, structure was meant to keep non-literals excluded or uh, out of the Black Sea and ratify the existing uh, distribution of naval power or existing distribution of power, which was favorable, favorable to Turkey. This regional security architecture survived the Russia-Georgia war of 2008, but it collapsed, definitely collapsed after the Russian annexation of Crimea. And Russia no longer needs such a regional security uh, architecture because it has gained its self-confidence and it, um, the Russian uh, chief of staff uh, declared 
less than 24 hours before his first visit after the, you know, the Su-24 incident that uh, the Black Sea was uh, a Russian lake. I mean, it was no longer dominated by NATO or Turkey. Uh, the Russian annexation of Crimea, Crimea uh, uh, created other complications for Turkey. I mean, it brought uh, the Russian uh, annexation of uh, uh, Crimea resulted in uh, set the seal on Russian ascendancy. And also uh, it had a bearing on the demarcation of the exclusive economic zone in the Black Sea. You know, of all the seas surrounding Turkey, the Black Sea is where Turkey does not have any disputes, legal disputes whatsoever with other littorals. The, uh, the exclusive economic zone had already been demarcated by the, among the littorals, uh, indeed in the, uh, in the late Cold War era or uh, just a few years before the end of the Cold War. What complicates the situation is that you know, because uh, Russia annexed uh, Crimea and because uh, uh, this uh, distribution of exclusive economic, economic zone is based on the Ukrainian possession of the Crimea, uh, at least uh, this, the situation as regards to the Ukrainian economic, exclusive economic zone and the Russian econo ex exclusive economic zone may be a bone of contention in the future affecting Turkey's status. The Aegean is the focus of Turkish, has been the focus of uh, Turkish naval uh, strategy or sea power priorities. And in the Aegean, you know, we have a list of issues, disputes, okay? And this reflects uh, the Turkish perspective, the continental shelf, the territorial sea, the airspace, flight information region, the militarization of the islands, and the so-called gray areas issue, which uh, came out after the Kardak EMEA crisis of 1995-1996. And I call them the old stakes in the Aegean. And you know, this continental shelf is an ongoing dispute. The, the two countries have been enduring this dispute and they have not uh, done anything substantial since 1987 to uh, settle this uh, matter. Uh, and the dispute uh, basically stems from the contrasting interpretations of the, the principles for delimiting continental shelf in the Aegean. Both sides, you know, agree that the principle of equidistance should be applied, but their understanding of equidistance is dramatically opposed to each other. Uh, and here the crux of the problem is the effect, effect of islands in deciding who gets what. In the Turkish interpretation, the islands should not have any effect on the distribution of uh, maritime jurisdiction areas, I mean, the continental shelf in the Aegean. And therefore, the, eco, uh, the median line between the two countries should be the red line you see on, on, uh, in, on this map on the right-hand side. Whereas for, for the Greeks, the islands should be taken into account in deciding who gets what. And, uh, if you apply the eco distance principle uh, uh, according to a Greek understanding, then the, uh, the median line is that blue line, which is slightly off, the Tur uh, off Turkey's existing uh, territorial sea claims. Uh, and also they differ on means to settle this dispute. Turkey has been favoring bilateral negotiations, whereas uh, Greece, uh, uh, is more prone to lean on international adju adjudication mechanisms uh, through the application of United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, one, uh, and the, the core issue is the territorial waters or the territorial sea in the Aegean. Currently, both Turkey and Greece claim six mile territorial uh, sea limit in the Aegean. And uh, you ha we, I have two maps on the right hand side of the slide. The one uh, on the left uh, shows the current situation, the status quo, and you see there is plenty of room for transit, you know, uh, freedom of navigation, free passage. But once Greece uh, goes ahead and extends the breadth of its territorial waters, 
to 12 miles, then uh, it will be impossible for a Turkish ship to sail from Istanbul to Izmir without uh, traversing the Greek territorial waters. Um, Turkey is not a party. The, uh, the 1982 UNCLOS uh, 3 uh, uh, document or instrument and the right to extend territorial waters to 12 miles stems from this uh, con uh, uh, convention. And Turkey considers Greece's extension of uh, its territorial waters beyond current six miles as a casus belli or a cause for war. So in other words, Turkey has time and again expressed its readiness to go to war over this issue if Greece one day decides to extend its territorial waters beyond six miles. I skipped a number of issues in the interest of time, at least I so I thought. Um, uh, the militarization of the Greek islands uh, is another issue, and it has been uh, brought up, especially referred to many times in Turkey in the context of discussions of uh, Blue Homeland. While uh, under uh, Greece acquired most of the islands in the Aegean under different treaties, uh, um, and uh, the status of those islands are governed under different uh, international instruments, you see a map of territorial expansion of uh, Greece and uh, the, uh, there are islands which were acquired after uh, the Balkan Wars and uh, the Greek ownership of those islands were affirmed by Turkey under the Treaty of Lausanne. And there, are, there is the Dadakanese Islands, you know, uh, towards the bottom of this um, uh, map uh, shaded in purple. Uh, those were taken over from the Italians at the end of the Second World War. But uh, what is common uh, uh, as regards to the status of those islands, they were demilitarized. They were uh, transferred to Greece under the condition of demilitarization. In other words, they were not supposed to pose a threat to Turkey. And Greece uh, remilitarized those islands, most of them, especially Lemnos, which is most bothering for, for Turkey, and several islands which are very close to Turkish uh, coastlines. Uh, and this is, an, this is a security issue, at least Turkey considers it a security issue. Now, as for new stakes, we have the exclusive economic zone. Uh, it became a hot topic after 2003 when the Greek internationally recognized government of Cyprus publicized its exclusive economic zone and began to conclude agreements with other littorals in the Eastern Mediterranean. And indeed, the Greek, uh, the Greek Cypriot declaration of ex exclusive economic zone combined with what is perceived to be Greece's exclusive economic zone claim in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, on the top map, you see a red arrow pointing a very small uh, uh, piece of territory that is called the island of Castellarizo or Maze in Turkish, a very small island. But according to a map published in the Atlas of uh, European Union's borders, uh, based on this uh, small piece of territory, Greece, according to Turkish calculation, claims 91,000 square kilometers exclusive of eco exclusive economic zone uh, at the expense of Turkey's exclusive economic zone claim. So the map on the top shows uh, the combined Greek and Greek Cypriot claim, whereas the map on the bottom shows, according to, of course, Greek interpretation, the Turkish uh, claim of exclusive economic zone in the Eastern Mediterranean. This is the debate around which, uh, or this is the issue around which the Mavi Vatan or the Blue Homeland debate has been taken shape. Uh, in the Mediterranean, Turkey is a lone wolf. You know, uh, as soon as Greece uh, declared its exclusive economic zone, the late, uh, uh, late Admiral Özden Örnek initiated a national naval operation called Mediterranean Shield. And uh, the official uh, uh, purpose of the operation was to protect the recently uh, operational or uh, the, the secure, uh, the Baku Tbilisi Jehan pipeline, which became recently operational. Uh, now, uh, due to Syrian civil war, which has been uh, going on uh, for more than 10 years now, Russia uh, came back 
to this part of the Mediterranean and it established an A to AD bubble. So therefore Russia has a say in the, uh, at least from a military perspective, a say in the, Medi uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Israel remains a key player, but until 2020, you know, Turkey and Israel were able to maintain reasonable level of uh, diplomatic, political and less reasonable level of military relations. But after the Mavi Marmara incident, you know, Turkey lost Israel and this had a dramatic impact in the naval power balances in the Eastern Mediterranean. Israel is now, you know, exercising with Egypt, uh, uh, Cyprus and, uh, and Greece. And most exercise scenarios, of course, involve a country which is very reminiscent of Turkey, a fictitious country. So, uh, the Turkish position, you see, uh, this uh, this picture indeed caused a lot of concern in Greece because it was the first time President Erdogan appeared uh, before a map showing uh, the extent or the boundaries of uh, what is claimed to be uh, Turkey's blue homeland. You know, this was taken uh, as his endorsement of the concept. Indeed, for a while, you know, he sat on the fence. I mean, in Ankara, the opinion there was. There, there was not a unity of opinion. There were hardliners and there were uh, softliners. But with this uh, picture, indeed, it, it was understood that Erdogan decided to throw his lot with the hardliners who had been arguing, advocating declaration of exclusive economic zone in the Eastern Mediterranean, concluding an agreement on, uh, on the um, areas of maritime jurisdiction with the government of national accord in Libya, and finally building naval and air bases in Cyprus, modeled on the British bases, you know, I mean, they would be sovereign, so their status would not be affected by any future settlement, whether, you know, reunification or, uh, 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 you know, making uh, uh, the division of the island a permanent feature of the political setting. So the agree agreement with Libya, you know, this was uh, a, a rather unusual interpretation of the provisions of the international law on the sea. But based on this understanding, who was indeed <coughs> very strongly uh, uh, advocated in the public by now retired uh, Rear Admiral Jihad Yaija, you know, uh, based on this interpretation of exclusive economic zones, you know, the, the the two countries, Libya and Turkey, facing each other. So they concluded an agreement. And this agreement indeed was meant, in a way, to forestall any Greek uh, claim uh, of exclusive economic zone in the south of uh, Crete, an island, and Rhodes, uh, also, in other words. And indeed, uh, uh, the idea was that if uh, Egypt could be uh, taken on board as well. This would enable both Libya and uh, Egypt to acquire more exclusive, largely exclusive economic zones uh, than if they concluded agreements with Greece. But uh, Turkey obviously was not able to persuade Egypt on that matter because uh, uh, when Turkey registered its uh, agreement or memorandum of understanding with Libya with the United Nations, you know, Athens uh, was able to persuade Egypt to conclude an exclusive economic uh, de uh, zone deal with it, and therefore that changed the situation. So, coming to Blue Homeland, indeed, it was a term coined by Admiral Cem Gürdeniz. He was a very close as associate of Özden Örnek. You know, uh, you see uh, on the picture uh, on the right, uh, two, of, uh, two of them sitting together. And uh, he had, or Cem Gürdeniz had a personal experience with suppliers reluctant to release warships to Turkey. Uh, he was uh, earmarked to command the first ex-USS Periclass frigate to be transferred to Turkey by the United States. But the transfer uh, was scheduled to take place around the time which, wa which right after uh, the Emir Kardak crisis. And the Clinton administration at the time was imposing an, uh, a covered em arms embargo on Turkey. So, uh, uh, then I think he was uh, uh, a commander, you know, Commander Gürdeniz flew to United States uh, at least three times 
to get his ship, but he had to come back each time because United States did not release those ships until 1999. So he had a per, uh, first uh, hand experience, personal experience with, you know, dependence on foreign suppliers for warships. Uh, when he coined the term, what he had in mind uh, was to come up with a blanket term, a composite term covering various types of mar maritime, ar uh, ma maritime areas under Turkey's juris jurisdiction. Because for the layman, for the average person, you know, it is very difficult to distinguish, uh, make a distinction between the territorial shelf, the continental shelf, the exclusive economic zone, the interior waters, etc. So he came up with this blanket term, which indeed proved to be uh, very, uh, how should I say, very useful in raising the public awareness on maritime issues in Turkey. And indeed, uh, uh, it was a very smartly coined term because uh, by introducing, by inserting the term homeland or Watan, he was able to tap into uh, the, the terms appeal, existing appeal uh, on the, in the minds of Turkish people anyway. Now, how blue uh, homeland is conceptualized. You know, you see uh, the sea surrounding uh, Turkey and uh, the areas of maritime jurisdiction that should be claimed by Turkey according to this doctrine. And we're talking about uh, an, a maritime area or covering 462,000 square kilometers. Keep in mind, you know, Turkey is, you know, uh, uh, you know Turkey's uh, territory you know, the surface area is about 800,000 uh, squ uh, uh, kilometers square. So we're talking about, you know, uh, uh, you know, addition, a uh, 50% addition uh, or increase in Turkey's conception of uh, uh, homeland or Watan. What does that mean? Of course, there is this inter-service rivalry dimension to it because, you know, militarily, uh, Turkish defense, Turkish strategy was dominated by the army because army was the first and more had remained the first and most important instrument of defense for Turkey since uh, the Republic. So by extending the boundaries of Turkey or by adding so much uh, areas of jurisdiction, you know, uh, Navy, Navy could justify its claims for a bigger share from the budget because their role in the defense of the Republic would be at least comparable to the army. So they ex they're probably expecting uh, a return in, the, uh, in, in terms of recognition and budget share. Uh, the doctrine, you know, it gained so much traction that two years ago, uh, uh, Turkey conducted uh, its largest national naval exercise in 2013. It was first of its kind conducted in the Black Sea, in the Aegean, in the Mediterranean simultaneously with its center of gravity in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was a big deal. There was, uh, there was coverage, you know, uh, very extensive coverage in the national media. And of course, the inter international attention, uh, it grabbed international attention as well. But last week, indeed, the second uh, Mavi Bartan or Blue Home exercise was held. But uh, so far, it, it is not possible to say that it raised or it uh, grabbed a similar degree of attention. So what does Bruno Homeland Doctrine or strategy stand for? Well, is it an expansionist idea? Because when you look at the map, you know, it's not easy, to, it's not possible to make a distinction between Turkey's, you know, territorial sea claims, exclusive economic zone claims, because all of them are lumped together in that, uh, 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 in that on that map and therefore you know uh, especially if you base your judgment on the recent uh, naval and military assertiveness of Turkey you know it corresponds to an expansionist idea designed to grab and rich energy resources in the eastern Mediterranean at least this is how uh, French President Emmanuel Macron preferred to frame it but for uh, its advocates in Turkey, you know, Blue Homeland is nothing more than a defensive strategy. It is meant, it is aimed at preventing Turkey's strangulation, you know, uh, uh, by those who want to deny Turkey access to the seas. 
In other words, you know, it's a reaction to those who try to landlock Turkey by denying it access to the seas. And this interpretation indeed is based on Turkey's unique historical experience and its geographical position. Uh, because uh, based on the Ottoman uh, ex experience, uh, the, the advocates of the idea argue that whatever the Ottoman Empire and Turkey was, whenever, sorry, the Ottoman Empire and Turkey was weak at sea, it faced existential threats to its survival. The case in point, of course, the Ottoman Navy in the reign of uh, Abdul Hamid II, uh, you know, uh, in, under his, in his reign, the Navy, the fleet was locked in the Golden Horn and it, it was rendered inoperational and therefore <coughs> the empire uh, sustained a, a number of significant territorial losses due to lack of an operational fleet. This is a very Mahanian reading of history, you know, like, you know, the Mahan's uh, work on uh, the influence of uh, sea power on history. So this is a very Mahanian interpretation, but because of uh, 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 absence of an operational fleet, Ottoman Empire had lost Cyprus, Crete, the Dardanelles, of course, this, uh, the Crete and Dardanelles uh, after uh, uh, the reign of the Abdul Hamid and the Aegean Islands. And uh, they draw analogy to the Abdul Hamid II period and the court cases, you know, such as Ergenekon and Balios, which resulted in the purge of many bright uh, naval officers, officers from the ranks of Navy. So such cases were meant to brought the Turkish Navy down on its knees in order to turn Turkey into a US satellite. And of course, as a uh, result of uh, Turkey losing its uh, independence, you know, the Kurds would open a corridor extending to the Mediterranean all the way from Northern Iraq. Uh, and uh, this would also help enable the Kurds to in in declare an independent state by carving some territory out of Turkey. And all in all, indeed, uh, weakening of Navy would help Turkey's adversaries and encircle Turkey and deny it access to the resources in the seas surrounding Turkey. Therefore, uh, Tur uh, Turkey's economic development would be curbed. <coughs> Consequently, this strategy, according to its advocates, is the idea that stands between a new treaty of Serbs. You know, uh, Serb treaty was one of the peace treaties that was concluded after the First World War in Paris, but it was never ratified. It was uh, replaced uh, uh, in, in its stead. I mean, Turkey signed the Treaty of Lausanne. And therefore, uh, uh, Blue Homeland is Turkey's response or should be Turkey's response to attempts to impose a new treaty of SEV on Turkey at sea. And by extension, Blue Homeland represents a new national pact, Misako Milli. National pact was the last resolution, the last Ottoman parliament adopted about the boundaries of a future Turkish homeland in the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, Blue Homeland indeed is the Misa Kamili, the national pact in, uh, uh, for Turkey. Therefore, Turkey cannot compromise on uh, the, the extent of the Blue Homeland as it is presented by its advocates. In other words, Blue Homeland indeed is the blueprint for the new, a new Turkish war of liberation. Uh, that's all. Uh, for me, I don't know, uh, it took longer than I anticipated. Sorry about that. I, that's the end of my presentation, Balkan Ujam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah Ujam, uh, for, uh, for an excellent, excellent presentation and you know, uh, finishing up with, with the inside view of those, uh, uh, those who advocate uh, this particular position in Turkey. And I will be opening up for uh, questions and answers um, as I give some, um, some time for people uh, to write up and think their questions. But let me take the uh, opportunity and, and, and abuse the privilege of being a moderator here and ask you um, two quick questions and maybe push uh, back a little bit on uh, a relatively uniform understanding of, of the Blue Homeland and you know, strategy or doctrine um, in, in Turkey. Two things uh, came to mind. First, as you pointed out, uh, Turkey is the lone wolf uh, at this stage in the Eastern Mediterranean and 
basically no allies uh, apart from the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus um, uh, in, 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 in either in the Aegean or the, or the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, having no allies, having no one on, on their side in, in this particular way um, is definitely uh, inimical to um, Turkish, uh, Turkish national security uh, and national interest. Um, what is being done wrong? In, one, in other words, why there are no allies and what, how this can, be, um, uh, this can be remedied, this particular thing. And the second question is, um, and, and this is, you know, feel free you know, to skip this one, but um, the, uh, the, the hardcore proponents of uh, the um, uh, uh, Blue Homeland doctrine in Turkey also tend to have um, a, a, a pro-Russian uh, uh, point of view when it comes to a variety of international uh, issues, which, uh, which is, to say this least, quite surprising. Um, given the history of, of relations with, uh, with with Turkey and Russia, and and and, and the you know the Russian presence in uh, in, in, in East Mediterranean, as well as the existing uh, dominance uh, at the Black Sea after the illegal annexation uh, of Crimea uh, by Russian Federation in 2014, um, uh, are are they too blind to um, the the potential risks uh, that involve? Um, uh, you know, ignoring uh, the, the 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 Russian um, uh, potential uh, in 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 you know in naval terms as well. Hojam, you are muted. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot to turn my mic on back on. Uh, you want me to answer it right away, or shall we collect questions? Oh, oh, people are taking their time to, okay, prepare no, their notes. Those are two questions, very perceptive indeed. I mean, uh, uh, indeed, I mean, uh, you know, uh, for its very strong advocates, you know, Blue Homeland is an existential issue. So if you care about your country, uh, you shouldn't be opposing the idea. OK, because, you know, uh, this is a life and death matter. Therefore, you have to choose your side. For them, it's, you know, it's either black or white. You have to be clear on that. And you very rightly draw, drew attention to uh, their silence as regards to Russia. Indeed, I mean, Turkey is encircled by Russia. You know, the Russian scander and missiles are deployed in Armenia. Russia set up an A2, A, uh, A2AD bubble uh, in the Crimean Peninsula. And to set one day after the, the Turkish uh, F-16s shot down a Russian bomber, they moved S-400 uh, missiles in, uh, in Syria, uh, uh, in the coastal parts of Syria, and they effectively established yet another bubble, A2, A2 bubble, A2AD bubble uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, the only thing missing here is uh, a, a new A2, another a new S400 bastion in Central Anatolia to complete the link, you know, uh, of uh, the, the link uh, between uh, from uh, Crimea to to Syria. Also, I I didn't include uh, this map uh, in my presentation, but in 2019, uh, Russia conducted a very large scale naval exercise in the Eastern Mediterranean and they now text 10 areas for uh, live practice, etc. You know, they declared 10 patches of uh, maritime area as danger zones. One of them was between Turkey and the North uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, a huge patch. You know, it was the message was clear, you know, you know, you, you cannot move anything without my consent between Turkey and Cyprus. The message was clear, but, you know, those uh, Russian, uh, how should I, pro-Russian circles indeed prefer to overlook that. Uh, they never mention, they never uh, bring up uh, the fact that, you know, for the first time, when the Cyprus problem dispute was debated in the United Nations Security Council, right after the referendum on the island in 2004, you know, Kofi Annan 
prepared a report which was very critical of the Greek Cypriots, you know, approach to the uh, to his plan. Well, that report, which was which would which would have been the first pro-Turkish, if I may, report in the history of the dispute in the United Nations Security Council, was vetoed by Russia. Also, in the context of uh, uh, the dispute in the Aegean, Russia, I guess two months ago, officially stated that Greece has right to extend its territorial waters to 12 miles in the Aegean. However, you know, uh, these remain unnoted or uh, uh, ignored uh, for the sake of a larger, how should a framework of Turkish-Russian cooperation. Uh, and therefore, uh, that's a very interesting point. And from time to time, I question that. Uh, and, but uh, for the time being, I guess, uh, the public enemy number one is the United States and of course, Greece. Uh, thanks a lot, John. What about the? Uh, and there are a couple of questions coming up here uh, on the same on the same issue. How does then Turkey? You know, what's sort of the end game here? Um, and and what 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 you know what, what what's missing on 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 the um, uh, Turkish doctrine or the approach uh, that it it has to go alone and and with, without any allies? Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, there were a critical uh, points. Well. First, I have a very constructivist answer to that question, although I'm a hardcore realist. Uh, let me uh, say a few things. Uh, the current or Turkey's new political elite, you know, views the world through a very different prism. You know, people like me and probably like you, I mean, tend to see world divided into territor sovereign territorial states, right? So these are our units of analysis, whether we liked it or not. That's a different issue, right? But for the new political elite in Turkey, you know, the Westphalian world does not make any sense. That doesn't correspond to their cognitive understanding of the world, okay? So uh, in pursuit of uh, a policy, uh, ideologically driven policy, transcending the national boundaries, you know, uh, Ankara, sacrificed uh, its long uh, standing relations with countries like Egypt and, and Israel for the sake of building a new Middle Eastern regional order, which would not be based on the Westphalian concept of state. And with the Arab uh, Spring, you know, they thought they were very close to reconfiguring the whole Middle East. But the problem, uh, the Arab Spring, you know, after 10 years, unfortunately, has not gone uh, to, <coughs> has not covered the distance we hoped it would, it would cover. So this was a big disappointment. Now, all of these issues, all, all of these, uh, all of these uh, topics, which are covered under the Blue Homeland Land Doctrine, have drawn on the Westphalian understanding of state. Now, uh, we are trying to rectify a policy, you know, which was based on a totally different uh, set of uh, assumptions with a Westphalian uh, fix or Westphalian quick fix, and, but we need allies. But in the process, we lost, you know, uh, the countries, the partners, the potential partners, which would be useful in deciding you know, who gets what in the Eastern Mediterranean in particular. You know, Turkey cannot conclude even today a deal with, with Syria. Lebanon you know, it has been holding, you know, uh, kind of delaying an agreement with Cyprus and, uh, and Israel because Turkey still is, in, Turkey is still important for them. So therefore, uh, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, it's a game played by national states, and therefore you have to think and act like a national, uh, sovereign uh, territorial national state these days. So uh, uh, Turkey is trying to backpedal on its previous mistakes, but the cost time, I'm afraid, will be enormous for Turkey to, you know, mend those uh, uh, ties with those important states. There are signs that, you know, Turkey's. Uh, trying to, uh, is going to, uh, at least Turkey, you know, is intending to normalize its relations with Egypt and Israel. So 
this may uh, kind of uh, turn things uh, a bit easier for Turkey. But otherwise, you know, uh, Turkey's pursuit of Turkey's regional ambitions, you know, uh, cost Turkey potential allies. And uh, there was talk of this precious loneliness, you know, I mean, obviously they would not care uh, being uh, left on their own because they would be still standing on the moral high ground, but it didn't work like that. Uh, uh, loneliness, I mean, is not good for states in a world marked by anarchy, you know, however you define it. Uh, excellent, Ojam. I, I, you know, the, the, the delusional policies of Ahmed that with all of these zero problems with neighbors turn into, you know, uh, zero neighbors with no problems no problem. uh, uh, for Turkey at all. I do have two questions that I'd like to quickly ask. We're, we're coming to the end um, of, our, of our session here. Uh, one from uh, Professor Ozai Mehmet. Uh, Ozai Ojam asks about the Lausanne Treaty and, 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 and wonders whether the uh, Lausanne Treaty as an international treaty uh, does not supersede UNCLOS um, it, when it comes to um, Turkey's uh, you know, uh, naval uh, naval arguments or, or, or strategy, that's number one. And the other question comes from Barış Ateş, um, uh, who thanks you for the for the presentation and asks your your expectations or forecast about the Eastern Mediterranean. You know, what are the possible solutions? You know, where does this end? Um, uh, eventually, or are we going to perhaps, I'll let my, my editorial comment here, or are we going to see uh, a, a continuing sort of deadlock um, in the years um, ahead, very much similar to other uh, uh, problems that Turkey has, say, with, with being Greece or, or, or on, the, on the issue of Cyprus, uh, for example. Uh, if I got Mehmet Oja's question right, uh... You know, in the hierarchy of legal instruments, you know, uh, Lausanne Treaty cannot uh, prevail over UNCLOS III, you know, and because they deal with different things. I mean, Lausanne uh, is a peace treaty concluded after the Turkish War of Liberation. Uh, uh, certainly, I mean, there are parts of it which deal with maritime issues, but uh, those are limited to the recognition of Greek ownership of the islands, demilitarized status, and the breadth of territorial waters, which was three miles for all states at the time. And Balkan, I'm sure you remember from your uh, international law courses, you know, uh, this distance was based on the range of a coastal gun. You know, the maximum range was three miles. Therefore, you know, beyond three miles was international waters. Uh, therefore, Lausanne Treaty, I'm afraid, uh, doesn't have much to do with the issues uh, rights and obligations under the UNCLOS III. Uh, I guess that answers the question. But of course, as for the demilitarization of the islands, yes, definitely. Lausanne Treaty is valid and it should be enforced, but Greece, of course, using uh, a set of different arguments to justify its remilitarization of the islands. And I, I don't wanna go into details of this. Barış Ateş, uh, what do you expect for a caster situation in the Eastern Mediterranean? Well, I guess I tried to hint at that, you know, uh, the blue homeland exercise two years ago, it was a big deal. This year, it was just an exercise. So I guess that tells about uh, the, how should I say, uh, the intensity of, uh, of the appeal of the idea, you know, and uh, Turkey doesn't have money to support uh, uh, assertiveness, military and naval assertiveness. And the last time indeed, there was uh, uh, an incident involving Turkish and Greek uh, uh, vessels or uh, machines of war was uh, the, uh, the voyage of TGG Çeşme, Çeşme, which is a, a seismic survey ship donated by the US Navy to Turkey in the aftermath of the Marmara earthquake in 1999, okay? And reportedly, according to Turkish sources, it was harassed by uh, the Greek uh, F-16 aircraft, uh, one of which, you know, kind of dispensed chaff or flares. And this was taken a, a sign of hostile intention. And TGG Çeşme is back uh, to its home port in Istanbul, in the Istanbul Strait. So, and there are no more nav taxes. Uh, the only nav tax uh, uh, in effect is the one that covers the Bay of Antalya, uh, you know, for uh, seismic surveys uh, and exploration uh, purposes. 
Therefore, and next week, uh, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlüt Çavuşoğlu will be uh, hosting his Greek counterpart and the 60, 62nd round of exploratory talks, which was a product of, which was a consequence of Turkey's EU candidacy back in 1999 is going to be held. So I think it's time for diplomacy. And for Turkey, the optimum solution is to freeze those issues, you know, as it had happened in the Aegean after the 1987 crisis. You know, no explorations, no activities, you know, a freeze, a memorandum, you know, a holiday. And probably what Turkey is interested in is having a similar situation in the Eastern Mediterranean where no one will be drilling, you know, exploring, prospecting for natural resources. And also, I guess, one consequence of Turkey's assertiveness, although it earned Turkey more enemies than friends, uh, this assertiveness brought the attention back to Cyprus because, you know, uh, uh, there was at a, at a, for a while, I mean, there was this uh, assumption that Cyprus was a normal country, you know, could act like a normal country, could issue, you know, uh, oil uh, uh, exploration licenses, etc. Well, we're talking about a divided a a island whose status has not been decided yet. Therefore, in that regard, the assertiveness, if it has one uh, positive consequence for Turkey, is to draw attention back on the Cyprus problem. Thank you very much. Um, it looks like we have a lot more uh, to talk about in the coming years uh, on this issue uh, that it is not going anywhere. There was the joke. I don't know. I think I heard, might have heard from you or someone else um, that a, a young Turkish diplomat could get into the, the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and work on the Cyprus file and uh, retire working on the same file uh, because of the continuation that, of the issue. That goes for... Uh, senior academics as well. You know, I wrote my master's thesis on Turkish-Greek disputes in the early 1990s. And I thought I was done with the topic, but obviously, I mean, still, I mean, uh, <laughs> my work on that field is still worth something, unfortunately. Exactly, exactly. Ojam, thank you very much uh, for this uh, excellent presentation. And thank you very much for the participants, uh, for staying with us, for those here on the Zoom, as well as following us on, on YouTube. Please go ahead and, and, and subscribe to our channel on YouTube as well, which we'll be putting these, um, these talks as well as um, our fortnightly, twice a month um, talks called Talking Turkey, uh, that we explore a variety of issues that related to Turkey and Turkish foreign policy. And you can also follow us on Twitter at MTS Carlton. Um, uh, once again, thank you very much and uh, keep an eye on uh, and go to our website, carlton.ca slash MTS um, to sign up uh, to hear from our um, uh, upcoming events.